All right, everyone. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, based on where you're at, uh, which part of the world. And welcome to this uh, live session, live workshop on, uh, we started talking about system engineering, but uh, then I realized that system engineering and cloud bit kind of in, are intertwined. And it forms also the foundation of uh, uh, what DevOps is all about, right? So if you want to get started uh, with DevOps, either you want to make a career in DevOps or you want to just, you know, pick up some, um, you know, ski skills related to DevOps. Either ways, it's important to build this good foundation on it. And from that point of view, uh, we're going to focus with this challenge. This is going to be more like a 60 days challenge, seven weeks challenge. It's around 50 days challenge, we can call it. And... Uh, this is more of a cloud ops challenge is what I'm going to call it. Or maybe you can call it as a cloud ops bootcamp or DevOps foundations kind of a bootcamp challenge, uh, whatever it is, right? And we're going to focus on four, four key areas, AWS, cloud, that is Linux, networking, and uh, scripting. And this is also based on the inputs that I've received from you. So most of you want to get started with Linux system engineering. And then uh, some of you also want to uh, understand how cloud works. So we're kind of combining both of that together. And uh, uh, we're going to create a challenge where uh, it would be mostly seven missions. So again, we're going to follow the same kind of a structure where we have uh, missions. And every week, there will be one mission with some objective in mind, right? And what are we gonna do here is instead of just learning about the theory, which is already covered, right? So it's already part of the course. You can go through the course, you can learn the theory. Uh, what I'm gonna show you here is how to take those concepts, take that uh, you know particular area or a particular topic and implement it in the real world uh, using a use case. That's what we designed the bootcamps for, right? So how do we go about doing that is what this challenge is about. So this challenge is not about, oh, learning about Linux, learning about just AWS, learning about networking and what is networking, what is routing table, what is, you know, uh, let's say scripting and uh, uh, what are the aspects of Linux. It's more than that. It is more about how you can take that knowledge, the concepts and the knowledge that you may have learned from the courses and actually implement it with one large use case. And good thing is it's the same use case that we are going to take that we would want to follow in the DevOps challenge or the uh, DevOps bootcamp or uh, originally what I created as an ultimate DevOps bootcamp. So the good news is you will not only build good foundation on these topics, you would also build some projects which you can take in your interviews uh, and ultimately our goal is to help you build the real world skills um, and help you advance in your career, right? Through that. Because when you start building your real world skills, you definitely can start cracking the interviews. Uh, you will understand how to implement things in real life. And that is what we are going to focus on. And from that point of view, we're going to take up a use case. That use case is what we're going to build in seven missions. Seven different missions is what we're going to follow. So since this is going to be more like a use case building, uh, you have to start from mission number one and build on top of that until mission number seven. It's not going to be like, oh, I will come back and start at mission number four and uh, I will be able to continue with everything that is. Uh, it won't work that way. So it will work like a bootcamp uh, that we typically do, like a challenge that we typically do, which builds on top of another. Only then we are basically taking a large use case and breaking it down into different components. And how are we going to do that? What is the use case? Let me talk about that. This is again the same application that we take with uh, Ultimate DevOps Bootcamp. It's called as Mogambo app. Mogambo is nothing but a mobile um, e-commerce platform with, uh, think of it as a mobile platform or a mobile mega store for mobile phones, right? And uh, it's a very specialized uh, platform. You can call it as, um, but it has the components of e-commerce, right? Uh, and what are those components? If you look at the architecture, the user interacts with the front-end application, which is the Node.js application. And then on the back end, there are many microservices. All of this is a microservices polyglot application, you can call it. Uh, why microservices? Because each of this component is responsible for one function. If you look at it, this is just a front-end and a router. 
uh, you have a different service for catalog, storing the catalog. Catalog has its own DB, which is a relational database, MySQL. You have a different application for the cards. That is where MongoDB comes in. You have a different application for user management, for payments, for order processing, for shipping, for queue, and so on. So each of the function is divided into these components and each of the component is managed with a one microservice. And each of that service can be done with its own language or written in its own language as well. So if you look at it, even though this is a pretty large scale microservices application stack, we are going to focus only on the part of it, like the user facing front end, that is the Node.js application, catalog and carts. And even then, it will basically be not only just the catalog, but catalog comes with its own DB, cart comes with its own DB. So if you talk about the use case, this is how it's going to look like, where we have uh, the user interacting with uh, the front end application. Okay, I lost the charge in this. So let me just draw it this way. The user will uh, interact with the front end. Let me just draw the application. This is the front end. Front end is Node.js, and that's what you interact with. And that connects with two services. One is a catalog service. Second is a cart service. So this is the catalog service. This is the carts service. And each of this has a backing database. For carts, we have uh, uh, Mongo. This is NoSQL MongoDB. And here we have uh, MySQL as the database, right? And that's what we are going to deploy. And that's what we are going to set up. Uh, that's what we are going to build on top of cloud. And then uh, why I have taken cloud and a combination of Linux is because when we set this up, we can use cloud to deploy this application within in a very secure and we can create a design, a secure environment and a network uh, to deploy this application. That's what we're gonna begin with. And how are we going to deploy this and uh, what are the missions involved here? So we have seven weeks and we'll take seven missions, one mission every week. So I'm going to roughly split it into these. So initially the first mission is where we're gonna start with the use case. That's what we are doing right now. And we'll design and build a secure network on AWS a secure and a custom network for deploying this application is where we will learn about VPC. VPC, IP addressing, route tables, internet gateways, firewalls. And uh, so it's not just about learning networking concepts, which you can do that through the course, but taking those concepts and implementing it for a particular use case is what, where you'll actually be able to relate to how things work in the real life environment, right? That's what we are doing here. So the first mission is to design and build a secure network uh, on AWS. Second is to deploy the front end application. Now this is the time when you will learn about EC2. You'll learn about SSH config. I'll have you configured SSH also. Uh, you'll do some basic configuration like system configuration, like user management, uh, package manager, uh, setting up Node.js application, you, which you may have done as part of sub exercises. Uh, running it through systemd. So what is systemd, how to work with it. So a little bit of that. Uh, so again, if you look at it, we are just taking the topics and uh, you know the key topics that we need to learn about. And from there, you start taking those topics and implementing it as part of this project, right? So that's what we are gonna do here. Next mission is about setting up the catalog service and database. So catalog service is where we implement Golang. This is a Golang application, the catalog service that is. And then that has a backing database, which is the MongoDB. We will learn how, uh, or we'll take cards or catalog, one of the services, right? So catalog DB is a, uh, catalog is a MySQL DB, sorry. So catalog is a MySQL DB. This is the opposite. So this Mongo goes here, MySQL comes in here. So cards is the no SQL database. So when we deploy the catalog service, we'll talk about, uh, uh, again, we'll continue with the EC2. And then we will also introduce a uh, relational database service that is offered by cloud called as RDS. How do we take that and deploy the application, connect the application with the backend, and then have that be kind of uh, connected to the front end services and so on. Uh, then we'll deploy the 
cart service. And this is where we will deploy a Java application with Maven and a MongoDB uh, with a MongoDB Atlas. MongoDB Atlas is one of the very popular services um, on cloud to run the MongoDB NoSQL database on cloud, uh, specifically kind of on the AWS. So that is what we're going to learn about, like how do we, so we take one relational database, one NoSQL database, uh, implement it, then we'll automate that same thing. So whatever you're doing here, uh, let's say in mission two, three, four, you start automating that by writing a script and uh, maybe just a bash script, that is fine. So how do you install it? Maybe how do you deploy it? So something on that line, maybe spend one or two weeks here. And then if time permits, take up order scaling and load balancing. Again, load balancing, reverse proxy, those things are useful, interesting to know, uh, and possibly cloud formation. So those are the missions that I'm trying to work on. And this will evolve again. This story will evolve as we go along, but roughly that's uh, what we want to uh, take up. And uh, uh, every week there will be some project that you will implement. And through that, you will learn uh, things and you will actually build stuff as well. And that is the idea about uh, this particular challenge, right? So I hope that makes sense. Uh, anyone has any feedback, any suggestions, anything, any topics that we should include, et cetera, apart from what you see here. Cool, so this will help you build the foundation on both cloud and Linux, right? And that's essential for uh, any DevOps practitioner and on top of that, we will also start, uh, I'm launching, I'm working on launching the next level of our membership, which will have advanced workshops and boot camps and stuff. And that is where uh, we're working on more stuff. Like uh, I was just going through an application or operating system specifically for Kubernetes called as Talos and uh, uh, a distributed uh, storage on Kubernetes again called, called as Longhorn. So these are the kind of things that we want to bring in. So there will be foundational course. This is the foundational course. Then comes the DevOps bootcamp. Then comes the, what we call as a continuous learning and upskilling program that you can, uh, you know, be part of as well. All right, so let's get started with today's agenda. So mission number one is going to be about designing and building a secure network on AWS cloud. Now, what are the things that we should include here? Anyone, anyone who has worked on AWS, if you want to build, build a design, build and design uh, a secure network for this project, let's say we call this as a Insta uh, um, Mugambo org as a project, and this is a larger project, but we're gonna take parts of it. This is a larger project. This is a larger application, but we're gonna take parts of it, just parts of it, and deploy it with Linux on top of AWS and learn about various aspects of it. Maybe some troubleshooting, maybe some networking, um, network related troubleshooting when we talk about applications and stuff as well. So we'll bring in more aspects of Linux while we are implementing and doing more stuff on, on in, inside the server, but we will get started with initially uh, building this securely on AWS. So if you have to build it securely on AWS, what comes to your mind? Uh, you can put it in the chat, you can speak, unmute and speak, either way is fine. Some of you might have gone through the networking, the system engineering bootcamp as well, and uh, mainly networking, right? So networking is where, uh, what we're gonna focus on today. That's what we're gonna start building uh, first, right? So a secure network, we'll have to design that, we'll have to design a network, and we'll have to make sure that it is secure as well. So what is it that we should be using to do that on AWS? I'm on AWS right now. And if I want to start building a network to deploy my application, the first thing as Amol um, says, it's VPC. And then Shiva mentions uh, um, like EC2 instance sizes will come in later when we start deploying the application. Like when we deploy the front end service, catalog, carts, that's when we'll talk about EC2, sure. But EC2 is about launching a virtual machine in cloud. But before we run that, we need to think about VPCs and VPCs is where we touch base on various aspects related to security and networking. So if you want to understand how networking and security is implemented, you should learn about VPC. That's why we are bringing in a combination of 
uh, AWS and uh, um, let's say Linux so that we can learn about both how to design the network, troubleshoot it as well, as well as how do we uh, go and learn about Linux on top of that. So what do we need is a v virtual private cloud or a VPC. That is the first thing that we start setting it up. To understand VPC and to understand how to design things on AWS in general, I'm just going to stop my video. I'll start explaining, focusing on this part. So if you want to build anything on AWS, right? Uh, you need to understand the global network that uh, AWS has. Uh, with AWS, uh, as soon as you create an, let's say, an account, and you can start with a free tier account, and whatever we do here, we you can uh, start with a free tier also. So we'll stick to free tier only, free tier utilization. So if you look at free tier for AWS, it gives you access to uh, many different components for free for one year. And that includes uh, 750 hours of EC2 per month over a period of 12 months. You get uh, a load balancing hours, you get uh, um, even uh, container registry, you get uh, uh, serverless with AWS Lambda, you get uh, database with RDS, you get storage with S3, a lot of things you can try for free for one year, right? And everything that we do, will be part of the free tier. So you, you don't have to exceed free tiers. Uh, you just have to, you know, if you just follow what I'm show, demonstrating here and try to do a similar thing yourself, uh, you will be within the free tier limitation. So wherever, um, you know, whenever we have to launch something, I'll make sure that uh, um, I provide specific instructions if it is gonna exceed free tier or what is what is it that you need to do in order to stick to free tier. Now, before we begin even talking about VPC, virtual private cloud that is, we need to understand the global infrastructure that AWS has. The moment you create an account on AWS, you have access to like, tw like 25 odd regions. I have not even enabled some of the newer regions, but you can see that there are regions available across the globe. And within the region, they have something called as a availability zone. What is an availability zone? What is the region? Uh, Anyone knows about it? You can unmute and speak as well. So let's make this interactive. Uh, by the way, anytime you have a question, feel free to stop me and unmute yourself, speak up. We're gonna do it more or less like the workshops that I conduct for corporates. We have lab time there. We will not do that because that becomes a four hour session, uh, but we uh, will make it as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, feel free to unmute and speak anytime. Now, to give an idea about region and availability zone, let's say uh, a lot of you are from India. So I'll stick to uh, example in India, right? So let's say we have uh, uh, Southern, India is a pretty large country. So let's take um, a Southern part of India, right? Uh, that is one geography if you look at it, right? So if you look at on the map, it's one geography and that geography has many cities. For those of you who are not from India, um, let's go to the maps, Google maps and you know check it out as well, right? So if I just zoom out, I'm currently in Bangalore. So if I just keep on zooming out, uh, not to the moon. So if you look at a country like India, right? And if you take the Southern part of it, uh, we have a few major cities here, right? So we have, uh, uh, let's say there's a Bangalore, there is Chennai, and let's say there is um, there's Trivandrum here, but there is one more uh, major city out here that is Hyderabad, somewhere. Uh, somewhere here, I think I'll have to zoom out, uh, zoom in a little bit, right? So if you take major cities, And if you just say, consider Southern part of India, and let's say there's a Bangalore, that is uh, Chennai, somewhere here, and then there is Hyderabad, somewhere, uh, somewhere here, right? So there are three different cities that we will talk about, right? Uh, so one region, that is Southern India, and there are three different cities. And uh, from the infrastructure point of view, cloud point of view, we assume that each of that city has a data center of its own. So there is one in Chennai, there is one in Bangalore, 
there is one in uh, hyderabad for me thank you mary my helping hand you are my helping hand this time yes. all right i'm just going to request all of you to be on mute unless you have a question or a comment to make so that we don't disturb anyone else all right so we have southern india as the region and then we have three different cities in which we have three different actual data centers right there is one in chennai one in bangalore one in hyderabad and imagine those data centers are connected via uh, some lease lines or private lines like fiber optic lines right they have um, you know um, high speed low latency network links connected to them you know uh, between them now that is the concept of region in this case the region name could be southern india and then there are different data centers uh, one in chennai one in bangalore one in hyderabad so what is the advantage of this kind of an infrastructure building this is basically and these are connected with high speed low latency links that is very important because that way you can host your web server here and another server here and one more here and leverage the different availability zones or different data centers so availability zones are different data centers right and each data center has its own power connection has its own network lines so if suppose there is a uh, there is a cyclone event like we we just have i just got a alert about cyclone in southern part of india and it can hit bangalore as well let's suppose that brings down my data center in bangalore if this data center is down I still have two other data centers functional, which means my 66% of my infrastructure is still available and I can quickly scale my application somewhere else as well in uh, other data centers. So that gives me the high availability. So if you want to design secure, high available, scalable infrastructure, you should be leveraging the concept of regions and different availability zones. I just gave you an example and analogy here to simplify it. But in reality, the regions and availability zones are typically named like this. So uh, the regions are named after the, the geographical area, uh, typically a city or uh, a part of a country, typically. Typically, it is cities based, right? So let's say there is a region. You can see these regions here. So if you log into AWS, and if you go to the top right corner, you do see the regions available here. So if you go to, let's say, VPC, EC2, any of that, you'll typically see the regions and you'll see the regions being uh, Northern Virginia in United States. There is Northern Virginia, Ohio, uh, Northern California, Oregon. Uh, in Asia Pacific, you have multiple regions in different countries. So in India, we have Mumbai and now Hyderabad. Uh, then we have uh, Japan with Osaka and Tokyo. Uh, there's North Korea, um, South Korea, sorry, with Seoul. Uh, there is Singapore, there is Sydney. There are multiple cities in Europe. Each of this is a region, and within this region, there are different data centers. So maybe you know they they are they are you know a few mi few hundred miles or a few kilometers, few hundred kilometers away, uh, and these are typically named as uh, availability zone A, B, C, uh, and so on. So there are two to five six re availability zones in one region. That's a possibility, and uh, basically the idea here is to so that you can spread your infrastructure in a way that. Your web applications are spread across availability zones. Maybe your data center is running somewhere here. There is a replica or a standby instance running here. This is your main database. This is a standby, which is syncing, um, you know, asynchronously replicating and your applications are connected here. Yeah. And even if this goes down, this will take over. If this goes down, these two are still available. So you can achieve fair amount of high availability with this concept, with this concept of availability zones. And good thing is data sent, data transfer between the availability zones is all free. If you're talking about data transfer between regions, so now let's talk about regions. So this, uh, we're talking about different regions here, right? So let's say this is a region called- Mumbai. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. See, uh, under a region, there is a possibility of having a number of uh, availability zones, right? Correct. So once we deploy an application, uh, is it does it mean that on under the, the application is available? It has been deployed on all the availability zones. Is it like no, that? you have to design it in that way. So we get these features from AWS, but you, to leverage those, you'll have to launch multiple instances. 
And uh, one way to do that is using something called as auto scaling group to launch multiple servers. So by default, it's not high available. Uh, when you launch a server, it would be either here or maybe here or maybe here in one of the available. You can choose that, uh, but not in all. So you have to design and make the choices in such a way that your application is deployed in multiple AZs and your database. Also, when you launch database, you have a choice. Either you say, oh, I want multi AZ or I don't want it, right? So if you say yes, it will set up multi availability zone like this. If you don't choose that, it will just be a stand, one single instance because there are costs uh, you know, involved when you launch multi AZ with two uh, instances, we are paying twice. Uh, when you launch multiple instances, again, you have to consider the cost and everything as well. And you get these technical features from the cloud, how to use it, whether to use it, it's up to you. Oh. All right. So this is fundamental concept of regions and availability zones. Regions are geographical different locations. So let's say if this is a Mumbai region, there is another region, let's say uh, in Tokyo, right? Now, how, what do I use this for? So there is region in Tokyo, there is region in Mumbai. Should I use it to launch one web server here and another web server here? Well, that's not a good idea because a few reasons. One is if your web server is trying to access the database here, that is over uh, either a AWS backbone or an internet. That's over the internet, that is chargeable, that is slow, there are latencies involved. Uh, so this is not a good idea. So what do you use it for? So you can use it for various things. Let's say I'm Uber and I have presence across the globe. I want to be close to my customers. So if I am setting up or launching my services in new country, let's say when Uber launched in India, um, maybe they built their infrastructure in uh, some of the Indian region to be closer to the Indian customers. And when they launch in, let's say Japan, uh, they want to have a similar setup done in uh, that particular region so that they can cater to the customers in that geography, right? So you use different regions, either you want to be, uh, you have a use case where you want to go global and you want to have your infrastructure closer to your customers, or you can use this setup to keep a backup in a different geography altogether like a DR policy. So let's suppose there is a regional failover. Uh, it happens really, and you want to be re ready with that. If you have critical data, you want to store it or the part of the world. And that's when you maybe you start replicating your database here asynchronously, but you start replicating it here. You start replicating your um, storage and all the critical data, all your critical files, uh, everything related to your application, you know, that you want to store, and keep permanent, you may want to store it in other part of the world as well. And that is where a multi-region kind of a strategy you can build. So you can build multi-region strategy um, if you have want to leverage global infrastructure or if you have a DR policy that you want to implement or you may want to have your setup like active setup here and passive setup in a different geography. And on top of that, oh, based on your customers, where they come from, you want to route them to a particular region. That is also possible. There are many different designs that you can build leveraging regions and availability. But typically the thumb rule is, if you want high availability, use the availability zones. If you want, you know, like spread your, spreading your infrastructure across uh, um, different geographies, then you go for different regions. That's the typical idea. Why are we talking about it is when we talk about building, let's say this is our use case that we want to deploy this application, we will have to pick one region to deploy this in. Let's say I want to deploy this in Northern California, right? So I'll have to switch to Northern California and then start deploying everything within that, including my network configuration that I was talking about. Now I'll come to this region and within this region, I will design my own network. That's where I bring in my virtual private cloud VPC. What is VPC? VPC gives me isolation, security, right? The first 
uh, you know, strategy that we implement here is isolation so that we are talking about public cloud, right? When we say AWS, when you create a server on AWS in Northern California region and I create a server, uh, those two shouldn't be talking unless we specifically wanted to, right? Because then uh, there could be someone else, you know, attacking your server, getting access to something, you know, exploiting some vulnerability. So you just want to lock it down. It's like, I'm just buying a farmland here. And then I, first thing that I want to do is, buy, you know, build a fence around it. So that I mark my territory and nobody should enter into this territory without my permissions, right? So that's what we do. So we build these fences around our houses uh, so that we can keep our property isolated from everybody else's. And how do we do that on cloud is by building a VPC, a virtual private cloud. A virtual private cloud is your own network, basically. So how do we isolate is at the network level, actually. So when we build the virtual private cloud, we also designate or design our own IP addressing scheme here. Something like this, 10.0.0.0 slash 16. Does anyone even know what does this mean? 10.0.0.0 slash 16. What is this? Let's just focus on this part. Uh, that that is called a uh, subnet mask. Divide a big network into some small part. Mm. What is the subnet mask here? Uh, that is sixteen. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a uh, this is this is a specific kind of a notation for IP addressing. It's called as so there is subnet mask involved, yes, but this notation is called as a CIDR notation. Yeah. So what is the CIDR notation or CIDR block? So it's like, uh, let's take an analogy to simplify this. Let's say we want to provide everyone in the world with a unique phone number. Let's say everyone in the world who has a cell phone device, a mobile device, a landline device, whatever it is, right? So whether you have a cell phone, whether you have a landline phone, uh, every one of us should have a unique number. Nowadays, we're not talking about landline anymore much, but um, most of us have cell phones and you have a unique number. That's how we can contact you on that specific unique number. How is it designed across the world? Let's have a look at that. And I'll take an example of a bit of bit. I'm more uh, kind of a orthodox example I'm going to take because I come from the world where uh, it was just telephones and uh, um, that is also easy to understand. So when you see a number, so the way we divide the numbers across the globe is that every country has their own unique country code. For example, for India, this is the country code. Uh, for United States, this is the one. For some country, it could be 4-4. Four, four. Some country, it could be 3-2, something like that, right? So if I show you a number like this, you can immediately find out which country it belongs to. Now, can you also find out which city it belongs to? Some of you may know. Uh, this may not be completely clear to someone who comes from outside of India, but uh, I'll try to explain it anyways. Right, so let's just take this number and let's just take another number where it starts with this So if you really look at it, the phone number is same. But it doesn't belong to the same city. It belongs to the same country as well. So if you look at this, the way we have divided this, is this is the country code. These two digits are for the country, 91. Uh, this is my city number. This is my actual number in the city. And then these two help me identify which city it belongs to. If it had been a landline number. Okay, I lost the connection to my iPad. Let me connect it back again. Okay, so this helps me identify these two digits. Help me identify which city it belongs to. 
And if it is one, one, it's going to be Delhi. If it is eight, zero, it's going to be Bangalore. If it is two, two, it's going to be Mumbai. It's going to be uh, some other city. This is uh, Chennai uh, or Kolkata. So something like that, right? So that is how we uh, identify the numbers. Now, for anyone who's not from India, this is very difficult to understand, right? So to simplify this, we can just say this, if you want to identify the country code at the country level, right? So if this is the number like 0, 1 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, let's just assume that uh, this is the country code. So what we are going to say is at the global level, my number, the way I define the numbers is every country will have a block of numbers. And then I'll use a prefix. This is called as a prefix. We'll call it as a prefix and we'll say first two digits are to identify your country. Now it becomes very easy. So every country has, when you look at this number, you exactly know that oh, first two digits are same. So they belong to the same country. Since it is plus nine one, it belongs to India. Uh, that's very clear, right? This belongs to, let's say, US and vice, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can keep on differentiating between the numbers very easily. Now let's just take these two numbers, right? It's not very clear uh, which numbers belong to which city and which is the actual local number. So what do we do is we take that slash two and we further divide it into slash fours. So that what, what, what we are essentially saying is, oh, slash two, we know that this is a country code and we're going to take that block and we're going to divide it into uh, code for the cities. And there we'll use prefix of slash four so that you know that this is for the country. And then you go to two digits further. And then this is the division for the cities. Now it's easily identify, identifiable that if it is starting with 1, 1, it belongs to city A. If it is 1, 2, it belongs to city B uh, and vice versa, right? And so on and so forth. So if it is 8, 0, it belongs to city B uh, or something like that. So that way you can take this block and divide it into sub blocks. And then based on that, you can figure out or what is your local number? And you can also figure out how many maximum numbers you can have, right? Because you can start with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and go on till line 9999, 9999. That is the maximum range that you can go with, right? So based on that, you add X number of digits. Because if I had only two digits for the number, I can only come up with a combination of uh, four. So uh, two rest to two. So I can either have zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. So if I want more numbers, I can only go with four numbers. I can only provide number for four people. The moment I add one more digit, so this becomes uh, a double, right? So two rest to three is eight. And then you can go start with zero, 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 one. And then you can add more like uh, zero, one, zero, and zero, one, one, and go on until uh, like eight digits or something like that, right? So that's how this works. So the number of digits here uh, define the range of numbers that you can have. Similarly, now coming back to your network, when we talk about VPC, this is a CIDR notation. It's called as a classless interdomain uh, routing. If you want to understand what is CIDR block, what is class-based, what is classless, uh, in general, what is networking, I'm going to give you a very interesting resource. I generally share this in all my workshops related to cloud and networking, especially with AWS. And this is a network design by Julia Evans. This is a free resource. She also has various other designs apart from this. Uh, let me show you. Let me show you the network design first. This is the one. And uh, there are many such net uh, designs available out there on her site. I think it's uh, jvns.ca. So if you want to learn about uh, various topics, like how do you debug with uh, um, you know some troubleshooting stuff related to networking, so application debugging, 
um, how DNS works in details, how containers work now. Uh, so very interesting zines they are. Uh, these ones are free. So these are the free zines, including the one I'm going to talk about, which is networking ACK. There's really, this TCP dump is also useful for a lot of network troubleshooting. This is for performance stuff. Uh, and S trace is for application uh, debugging and there's Linux debugging tools also. So you have very interesting set of zines uh, out here. I'll share this resource with you. You can go through it. You can download uh, all of these zines and get started with these free ones. And then later on, if you are interested, you can take these ones also. Um, so I genuinely enjoyed it. That's why I'm sharing this resource with you. I still remember I was on a flight. I was going to the airport and um, uh, I was on a bus to the airport and I just came across this zine and I went through the network, this very network zine, and I really enjoyed it. And I come with a pretty decent amount of experience with networking. I still enjoyed it a lot. Uh, so I highly recommend this uh, with very simple examples. She explains how things work, like what is a packet? Because what flows over the internet is a packet. When I downloaded this, there are like, you know, probably 100,000 packets out there, uh, which traveled across the internet, right? To help me transfer that data. So uh, how does a packet look like? You must know about it. So every packet has an IP address. That's what we are talking about right now. The source IP, the destination IP. So it's like sending up an envelope. So you write your own source address, your own address, destination address, their phone number, uh, the actual data, and there's an envelope, right? So this is an envelope. So uh, inside that there is a data. This is the actual data. Maybe you're transferring a movie or it could be just a PDF file, right? So it's the data that we're talking about here. And that gets you know, packaged into these packets. And these packets are what travel over the internet. That's how we are communicating even now. Uh, this very Zoom as a service, the stream that you're receiving is through the packets. And uh, this is pretty much, um, there are different protocols also involved there, right? So how do you get a cat picture is a very simple example here. How the DNS works, right? From the DNS, uh, how the DNS request works, how, what are the sockets? Because when you connect to Zoom, you've opened up a socket from your system to a server on Zoom, and there's a data tra constantly traveling on that socket, uh, and uh, that's what is happening. If you want a reliable delivery, you get TCP. Uh, if you want a speed and certain distributed systems which uh, where TCP is not feasible, you may want to use UDP. So how does HTTP work? HTTPS works. Uh, what are the network layers? Uh, what is a port? What is TCP versus UDP? The local networking is where we talk about these IP addresses as the notations. The notations is what we are talking about right now. This is a CIDR notation. So how does it work? Uh, what are the example CIDRs? These are some examples here. So if it is slash eight, uh, there's a prefix of eight. So this, this shows me the network address. This is the local address. This 16 will show me this is the network address. This is the local address slash 24. Uh, what is this 8, 16, 24? I'll explain that. But you should definitely go through this uh, uh, visit zine or this network zine uh, to understand what networking is, right? Very useful, very important resource. I will share this very uh, network zine link with you. All of you should download it and go through it um, later. Now, coming back to the IP address, what is this slash 16 does it mean, right? What does it really mean? So when you look at an IP address, let me bring up my presentation on it. So an IP address, this is an IP address that we are talking about, right? And every device in the world has an IP address, actually. Everything that is connected to the internet, sometimes not even connected to internet in your own network. If you just look around, uh, you'll find you know probably tens of devices just around you, right? And that could include your 
uh, laptop, your desktop, your uh, phone, your router, your uh, maybe uh, if you have any smart device like uh, washing machines or even smart TVs, smart TVs all have IP addresses. Your, um, you know, of course, the smartphone has an IP address. Your smart devices like Alexa and, uh, you know, Google Home and uh, your uh, devices which you can operate over uh, internet, your CCTV cameras or network cameras now, uh, everything has an IP address. That is what we are talking about, how uh, these IP addresses are defined, what is this slash 16 uh, and stuff like that. I'm just showing you my IP address of this system. This is my desktop. This is a Mac, iMac uh, desktop here. And this has an IP address of 192.168.1.2. .1 and that means there would be 1.1, 1 1.3, 1 1.4 uh, devices around me will have those kind of IPs as well, right? And this is a slash 24 network. Uh, how do I know? I can look at the broadcast. So if I see 255, that means this part is a broadcast. Everything else is related to network. So this part is network. So that means I have a slash 24. What that means is each of this dot, the IP address is a dotted quad notation. This is a dotted quad notation, right? Let's come back to IP address first. Let's just talk about IP address first. Every device over the internet, we are talking about TCP IP essentially. And out of that, we are talking about IP, which is the datagram and the actual IP address uh, and so on. And TCP IP initially was created as a military standard for communication. And then it became a standard over internet and LANs, local area networks. And when you talk about IP addresses, there are every device needs an IP address. In the world, if you want to provide unique addresses, there are about 4.29 billion addresses. That seems like a lot, but we would have been exhausted with these IPs long time ago if we had not used private addresses and uh, some natting and certain uh, other concepts that we're going to talk about here. So every device has an IP address, like mine has 192.168.1.2. Now, when we talk about this slash 16 slash 24, what does it mean? This is a dotted quad notation, which can be translated, converted into binary notation. Everything can be zeros and ones, right? And this is the binary notation for 192.168. This is 192. This is 168, this is 1.1. How does that work? If you want to understand that, let's take one address. That is my address here, 192.168.1.2. This is a dotted chord notation of the IP. If I want to convert it into binary, the way it works is you have this eight bits, which you can set to zero or one. If you set this to uh, zero is zero, right? Anyways, if you set this to one, the value of that is one. If you set this to one, that is two. If you set this to one, that is four. So it works like this. It keeps on doubling 16, 32, 64, 128. So value of this is 128. Value of this is 64. Value of this is 32. Value of this is 16. If you set this to one, that is, and so on and so forth. So if I want to say two, I will just set this one to one. So if I want to represent two in binary, it would be zero, zero here, and then one here, everything else zero. Right? And then if it has to be one, that would be, just enabling this part, one. So that means one and everything else is zero. So that should be fairly straightforward. Now comes 168. This is a little tricky because we have to do some mathematical calculations now. And uh, 168 would be, you'll have to set this to one so you take 128 plus what? Let's take 32. They'll give me zero, so six, 160, close by. I just need eight more, so 
or 168, right? So I enable this. So I enable this, 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 everything else will be zero, right? So, so if I add eight here, I get 168. So what do I do? I set these three bits to one, right? These three bits to one. Yeah, eight bits here. So this, this, and this. If I set this to one, I get that uh, number. And then I have 192. 192 is basically this plus this. If you add those two, I can add a smiley here. Uh, if you add these two, 128 plus 64, you get 192. So that makes it zero, 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 zero. Uh, that's how the binary notation works, really. Zero, zero, one, one. Everything gets converted into ones and zeros. You should be aware of that, right? So if you want to convert your IP address to binary, this is what it looks like. And then we add a CIDR notation. What it tells you is first 24 bits here are for the network, meaning this is for the network. Like I showed you the phone numbers, first four bits are for the city. This is the country, this is the city. So it's like that, right? So in here, these tells me that this is my network and these are the local IP addresses. So in my network, in my home network, I can have up to two raised to eight, so up to 256 IPs in total. That's why 256 is the number. And then there is a subnet mask and all of that. One is reserved for the network, dot zero. Sec, uh, this 255 is reserved. To, if you set everything to one, one, that is called as a broadcast address. So there is a broadcast address. So if you want to send it to all in the network, you're going to just enable one, 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 one here. And that is what goes in the packet actually. So as a destination. So if you are sending a broadcast, uh, how it would look like is um, just trying to get back to my browser. For broadcast, how it looks like is that packet, if you look at the destination address, that would be set to 1111. So that is how it works like, right? Now, practically, how do what is the purpose of this? If you want to understand that, we come back to VPC. We want to build the VPC. And that VPC is nothing but a network block that we create. A block of IPs, a network addressing, right? Block that we create. Right, this is the block. How much, how many IPs do I get? If you want to understand this, I'll give you a simple formula or a tool called a CIDR calculator. So here you just add the CIDR calculator. So you, I'll show you a VPC and that will give you clarity. This is the VPC. And this has the CIDR uh, block of 10.0.0.0 slash 16. Same one that I'm talking about here. So I take this and add slash 16 to it. So that gives me basically 64,000 IPs. So slash 16 will mean this and this is reserved for the network. Rest are for the IPs. That's why the IPs range from 00. zero. <laughs> this remains constant across the IP range, right? And the first IP will start with zero. The last will end with 255255. That's like adding a 999 to the phone numbers. That is the maximum you can get. When you set everything to one, when you set all this to one, you get 255.255 here. That is the maximum, right? So that is in the binary notation with dotted chord here. Uh, that is the maximum for one quadrant. So this IP range, what this means is for 16, 16 bits, as in this is the network, let's say 10.0, it will always remain the same. And the IP addresses will keep on changing from 0.0, .0 to let's say 0 0.1 and until you reach uh, something like 255. There will be 0 0.255, then we'll have 1.0, then we'll have 1.1 and until you reach 255.255. .255.
something like that okay okay i think my kids were drawing on my tablet that's why this has become so large just reduce that number okay so this is the network this is for the local addresses now what you can do is this is the vpc this is associated with one region let's say region called as northern california now we also want to leverage these availability zones right we've talked about that that region has availability zones i want to uh, leverage that and i will have some server here some server here in order to make this work you have to divide this network with this block into sub networks let's suppose i want to leverage two availability zones b and c that's what we have in northern california availability zone b availability zone c if you want to leverage to availability zone what you need to do is divide this into sub networks just like you take the entire block for the country which starts with plus 91 for four numbers and you divide that into different cities so you have this and you got slash 2 and in total there are 12 numbers right there are 12 numbers here uh, in total so two are reserved for this 10 are here so what do you do is you take two out of this and then you say i use slash 4 for the cities so that i can divide this into i'll reserve this for the cities and this will be my local numbers so my these country gets two city like 11 and 22 gets two more digits and then remaining eight are my local numbers similarly so that's what i'm doing right so i took the code for the country india and divide them into cities similarly here i take that network and divide it into sub networks subnet here uh, let's call it as subnet 1 and subnet 2 so that you can use or leverage different availability zones you can see that here this network here is divided into sub networks right these are the section sections of it you can see that so there are different sub networks right and then these sub nets have this is common six first 16 digits are common because that's what my network is that's how i identify my network and then i take remaining of this and i'll say oh i want to use first four digits for my uh like city we have subnets so first four digits for subnet that's why this became slash 20 so i took slash 16 and then i said i use four more digits for my subnetworks so out of remaining 16 i took four for my subnetworks so i can create as many as uh, you know this is the ip address this is the side of block this is my total network 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8 out of that first 16 bits are for the network and out of this remaining 16 remaining 16 i'll just take here you can divide this into some subnets with some local ips you can decide that if i say slash 20 here what i'm saying is these four i'll use for my sub networks and remaining are 12 digits right those i will use for my local ips or i can have two here which would mean this is for slash 20 if i say slash 18 slash 16 is what i'm starting with here the network and then i can say these two are for my network and remaining 14 are for ips 
that will give me more IP addresses, less networks. Because with two bits here, I can only use a combination of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Only four possible subnets. If I have four, I can create 16 subnets. That is the difference. So you can decide how many subnetworks you want. And based on that, uh, how many IPs you want in each and so on, right? And that's why you see slash 16 gives me 65,000 IPs. I'm dividing that block into subnetworks. Slash 20 would give me 4,000 IPs. Yeah. And then I can create, like, if, imagine 64K dividing divided by 4,000. So you're getting 16 subnets. In total, you'll get 16 subnets. Here you're getting with slash 18, you're getting 16,000. So four subnets. Four subnets, as I just said. With two, you can create four subnets. With slash 20, you can create 16 subnets with 4,000 IPs each. 4,000 IPs is the max here for one subnet. Here, the maximum is 16K. So do you want more devices? Do you want more subnets? You can create a very flexible configuration. And that is why it is called as a CIDR block. So CIDR notations basically give you an ability to create very flexible network configuration because earlier there, and this is called as classless interdomain routing because earlier there were only class based uh, ip addresses so either you can you could create like oh i want to create either a subnet of uh, uh, let's say 256 ips or directly 4000 and directly 64000 something like that the step was very large here we have with cider blocks we have a lot of flexibility and you can design your network however you want it. So two techniques we use to save the IP addresses globally is Natting and CIDR. I'll talk about both. And then there is a reserved class of IPs we created. Because we're talking about 4 billion total IPs. If everyone in the world has a unique IP, including every single device in your home, your smartphones, your TVs, your Alexas, your... Um, you know, smart devices, your C in network cameras, uh, we would have exhausted that IP space. So what do we do is your home to the outside world looks like one single network. That's what a reserved class network is. So we use the IPs from reserved class, like 192 to 168 here, which is the reserved class. This is not routed from the internet. Internet cannot route to 192 to 168 something. This is reserved LAN IP. So how does it work? The way it works is there is something called as a NAT or network address translation. So you may be in a college, you may be in a university, you may be in an office. Let's imagine an office with 40,000 devices. Let's, let's say there are 10,000 employees. Very common in Bangalore now. Uh, we have you know people with offices with 5,000, 10,000 employees or 4,000 employees, let's assume. And each one has different devices, like they have a phone, they have maybe a couple of phones, they have a tablet, they have a laptop, they have a desktop. So imagine four devices into 10,000. Uh, and I'm just talk, counting the devices per personal, not even the net, rest of the network and all that. So let's say there are 40,000 devices. So with NAT, what do we do? We save upon the public IPs because no matter how many devices you have within your premises, it could be office, it could be university, Let's say there are 40,000 devices in here. To the outside world, it looks like one single IP, right? Just one IP. So 40,000 is getting translated into one single IP only. The magic is at this level where we have a NAT router or any gateway that you have, your wireless gateway, your office gateway, your office router, your wireless router at home is doing the NATing. Because no matter what, I have an IP. When internet looks at me, and I can find out how internet looks at me using what is my IP. And you can find out your public IP. So there is IPv6, which is the new notation, which gives you unique IP. Everyone can have a unique IP there because there are like billions of IPs there. Uh, here, uh, probably trillions of IPs or even larger number than that, right? Uh, doesn't matter. So my IP here that I'm talking about is public IP is this, right? 170, 176, 85, 70, whatever it could be. So the idea is no matter how many devices you have at this level, it is getting translated. So this is where the network 
address translation is happening. It is just maintaining a table for that packet. So if you send something out, it translates that into the public IP of this. So the source becomes this IP, whatever the IP is that you saw. And then at the destination, uh, it receives it with that source. And when the response comes back, there is a translation happening here all the time. So this will know that, oh, this is this IP, and this is the packet, this is the socket, this is the host which sent it. And when the response comes back, it will also do the reverse translation here. So that is the translation between IP address, uh, your MAC address, and uh, public IP versus local IP and so on. That is the network address translation. With this, what happens is we are saving up on 39,999 IPs just for one office, one place we are talking about, right? And that's how we save up on the internet IPs. Anything that is sent to the reserved classes is dropped from the internet. It doesn't go out to the internet. It is It remains local so that you can communicate from your service to your router, to your you know a mobile device, to your network camera or whatever it is, uh, your smartphone and all that smart TV and all that. So you can communicate using the same protocol, but locally versus when you send it to the internet, the IP address will be different because when I'm connecting to something like, oh, I'm connecting to schoolofdevops.com, right? So that is not, that will never be a local IP for me. It will be a public IP. You can find out by running this. This does a DNS translation. Yeah, so School of DevOps has an IP of this. This is not a public IP, a local IP. This is a public IP. So when the IP is public, non-local, non-reserved class, then it will hit the gateway. Otherwise, it will remain here. For local, it will just remain here. The moment it is outside IP, then it hits the gateway. That's when the net NAT happens. Then it goes to the server, whatever the XYZ server is. That responds back and that comes back to me. That's how this works. Again, coming back to our practical implementation of uh, this VPC, uh, we create a network VPC that is, which is tied to one region and to leverage different availability zones. When you see these sub networks, these subnets belong to different availability zones. Some are one B, some are one C. Uh, that is the availability zone. One B, one C, and so on. Now, this is one dimension of it. There are four subnets here, actually. What is the other dimension that we want to think about? We want to create a secure environment. How do we add to the security? One is we are isolating with VPC. Great. The second dimension of that is part of our infrastructure can remain public. Web servers. Because you're external users are going to access your web server. So those remain public, but does your database need to be exposed to the outside world? Definitely not, right? So your web server should be able to connect to the database, sure, but not the external users. This should be denied at any cost, right? If you want to get in, you have to get in via some encrypted channel or something, some secure channel directly your user should not be able to connect to the database otherwise your data will be lost right so you want to secure that as well so what do you do is you divide this network into certain domains so that you can keep part of your infrastructure public and part of it private how do you do that again we are talking about network level segmentation so we create subnet so we will say we have public subnet one, public subnet two, there is a public subnet, uh, private subnet, sorry. So this is private, right? So there's a private subnet one, private subnet two. Uh, why not create just one public and one private subnet? Well, we still want to leverage availability zones. So you still have to have that mapping where your subnets map to the availability zone. So if you want to create uh, a setup where your database is replicated in different availability zone and so on, you must have two private subnets. And for web servers to spread out and scale, 
and provide you with high availability, you must have at least, at least we are talking about minimum of two public subnets, minimum of two private subnets so that we can leverage both the availability zones and the public private isolation as well. That is the way you design secure networks. You can also have dedicated networks for databases also. There are different ways you can design the VPC. You can have a VPC where your front-end application. So this is a 1B, 1C availability zone. This is a VPC with one region. And then there could be multiple sub-networks where you have public infrastructure here. Uh, there is middleware somewhere here. Databases are all private again. So you can create subnets dedicated to databases. And with CIDR block, you can divide it in different ways, very flexible way you can divide it. And you can have multiple different subnets and different levels of isolation so that you can lock down the access to database in a very stricter way and uh, so on and so forth. You can also have this design, you know, this way as well. You can create it any which way you want, right? And how is it relevant to the use case? Here, let's talk about that now. We're going to talk about just the front-end catalog and cards. So our databases have to be in private subnet always. So what do we do or what when, if you want to create a very simplistic design, I'll just suggest you a very simplistic design here. The way we would design this or we could design it is we start creating the VPC. in one region, let's say Northern California, and then we want to leverage the availability zones. These are different data centers. And we will also say we want some public, some private infrastructure. So eventually what it would look like is front-end catalog cards. Uh, this could be public facing stuff. So front-end definitely, so your front-end has to be here and it can be in different availability zones also. Your databases, both the databases, catalog DB, your cards DB has to be in private, right? Now, there are two options you have. You can in fact create a rest of this here, like cards and catalog or you can keep this, we'll keep it simple. So we'll say front end runs here, catalog runs here, maybe on the same server also, depending on how we want to do it, cards runs here. Right? So different types of servers running here. These are all public. I'm just color coding it for understanding what runs where. So cards application, cards application here. And the cards application talks to cards db catalog. Uh, this is the catalog db. This is the cards db. However, it could be right. And this talks to this. Cards talks to this. Catalog talks to this. So something like that. So this is how our infrastructure would look like eventually. And the users access the front end. They can possibly access catalog also, but not the database directly and then you can set up a load balancer like something like application load balancer reverse proxy could be nginx also could be kong some gateway here so that the users don't directly connect but they go through some sort of a gateway this is a scalable secure infrastructure high available infrastructure so if you if somebody asks you or ask you a question about how would you design a scalable, high available infrastructure, you can possibly draw this kind of a design. Uh, or even better could be, you can move these things inside here and uh, uh, put a gateway on top of that as well. So you can design it any which way. So if your front end is gonna connect, it depends on how you are rendering it. Um, if your 
if you are rendering it on the client side as in browser browser is connecting to front end this is the application design thing okay sometimes what happens is there are two different things let's say you have a microservice front end there is catalog there is carts and then backing databases so there are two ways you can render the application all the components of the application right so your application as in i go to amazon what i'm talking about is the front end can just be the scaffold the boxes the actual catalog actual products like this product this product this product whatever the products are those could come from a different microservice the cart when i add something to the shopping cart right if i just say oh i want to buy this uh, fan there's a ceiling fan and i add it to the cart the moment i do that the card gets activated and this got added to my cart right so this could be a different service altogether right so there are different ways how this is rendered in your browser a lot of times what happens is your browser is very heavy and the reason why you see a lot of times when you look at the resource utilization chrome is taking up like 50 70% of your cpu why because it is doing a lot of rendering so what happens is there's a javascript code which goes gets transferred from when you connect to this a lot of javascript code gets transferred into this javascript is a script running from your browser and this browser is what is rendering not just the boxes but a lot of times this is connecting to the front end for these boxes and then it is also making request to catalog it is also connecting to the cards right and that is more like a client side rendering everything is re being rendered from the client side or browser uh, it's doing happening in the browser a lot of things are just happening in the browser that's one way of going about it the other way is a server side rendering where what happens is everything uh, is coordinated via one single entry point it just connects to front end for everything front end connects to catalog so if i it, if it wants to load these boxes it connects to front end if it wants to re render the actual catalog and the images and what not it also goes via this to the catalog then this responds back with uh, the actual you know uh, what should be the catalog and all that and the images can come from s3 and all that that's fine but what to load what to show you uh, that is what we are talking about here right so that can happen from here everything here now happens via this particular guy and that is called as a uh, server side rendering so some it depends on uh, you should know this as a devops guy because devops guy or devops girl because when you set this up based on how this has been done your decision about whether to put these boxes in the public or private subnet will depend a lot of things would depend on that actually right so it depends on how your application is this is the reason why we're talking about devops developer and operations coordination because if there is no coordination if you know ops teams don't know about how this has been done how this has been designed uh, they would have no idea how to configure it how to best design the security for it and that is the reason you need to know about these concepts for sure right so this is why we are designing the network coming back to our design this is why we want to create vpc with four different subnets right that's the design we want to put in so that when we deploy this application later with the rest of the missions uh, we should have our basic secure infrastructure in place now how do you go about building this vpc is what i'm going to just show you by using a wizard that is very straightforward okay there are different ways of going about it but there is a, a wizard that i'm going to show you here so i'll create a vpc yeah with the wizard you can see this is exactly what uh, it's trying to do our diagram here our diagram with uh, i'll just clean it up so that you get an idea that what we are trying to do here is 
create a virtual private cloud, which gives me the security with four subnets so that I can leverage availability zones and public private infrastructure I can put in place. So VPC, four subnets, two public, two private. Now comes the question, what makes a subnet public versus private? And the answer to that is, okay, let me simplify this a little bit. No endpoints. Yeah, this is public. These are private. What makes it public or private? There is something called as an internet gateway. So in case of cloud, like AWS, there is a concept of internet gateway, which is associated with a VPC. That allows you to communicate the users when they talk to the server inside the way this communication happens is via internet gateway. And of course, the outgoing connection also goes via internet gateway. The difference between internet gateway and NATing is NAT would have been one way communication. If it was just NAT, your web servers can talk to internet, but not from outside. This won't work. That is the difference between NATing and internet gateway. With internet gateway, there is a two way communication. Your users can talk to your servers, servers can talk to the internet uh, and so on. So every VPC typically. So that is the reason why you see a public subnet is public because of the presence of the internet gateway. Now, how is this internet gateway attached to that subnet is there is something called as a route table. This is where the internet routing in general happens is right. So if I look at my routes, so you can see the routes also here. So I may be able to show you. Let me see. These are the routes on my system. Uh, let's make it just simpler and say, you know, this is all IPv6 stuff. So may look a little complicated, but uh, I'll show you simpler routes with the, with the example here. The route table is basically every subnet. If I go to a server here, that server will show me a route table like this by default. Okay. If I'm in a private subnet and if I'm, what makes it a private is this route. There is a route table with one specific route only. Let's call it as a private route table. What route does it have? It has this route only. So it is just 10.0.0.0 slash VPC route only. And it will say local. What this means is you can connect from here to here, here to here, here to here. I mean, whatever you have here, uh, anything in the VPC can talk to each other. That is important because, you know, you want to connect to your systems, your, uh, like if I want to connect from my laptop to this desktop, from my tablet. So I'm connected my tablet to this. How I have connected, this is connected to my tablet actually. Or my tablet is connecting to my, uh, uh, you know, this, this is my iPad connecting to my system. How is it communicating over a local area network? So this is my iPad. Uh, I have a phone. I have a iMac here. This is one screen and keyboard and stuff. So this is connecting here. My phone can connect here. These guys can share the data and all that. Uh, I may have a storage drive here. I may have Alexa I can just speak to. And that is connected, all connected to internet router. Each of this is connected to internet router. And through that, they can talk to me. So how does this work? There is a route table somewhere and the route says 192.168.0.0 slash 24 is your local. Meaning just let it go here. It doesn't travel over internet, right? So that is what it has. And then I am able to connect to internet because I also have a route which says 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Oh, send it via my Wi-Fi router. 
that's how the route would look like. Okay, it's some interfaces, so it will be going through some EN0 and a loopback. Loopback is local. EN1 is um, internet, so there might be 0000, or, or there are routes here. You can see that. 192, 168, 1 is my network, right? And that goes via the local. And then anything else apart from that, uh, this is the default route. And then anything else apart from that will go via something else, some other route. So uh, that would be via my internet gateway of sorts. So that's how this route will look like. So for this private networks, this is sufficient. But for internet, right, these guys have to talk to internet. Internet has to talk to these uh, uh, web servers. So here, it must have the local route plus it will have a route to everything else. It's like everything else, like star dot star, goes via internet gateway. That is how it's gonna look like here, internet gateway. I will show you, I'll create the VPC. I'm just letting it create the VPC and show you. This is a VPC with the subnets, four subnets, two public, two private internet gateway attached to the VPC, created the route table. That's how it works. So with cloud, the advantage is you can actually practically implement networking concepts. And then it's very straightforward and it's free. VPC is just free. Everything that you create with VPC is not chargeable, by the way, except for the NAT gateway. So don't create a NAT gateway. If you want to stick to free data, don't create it. I would suggest that, right? So that's one thing that you should keep, keep in mind. Again, NAT gateway doesn't get created by default right now, so don't worry about it. So I'll just show you the VPC here. This is the VPC called as Project VPC. Observe the ID ending 74. We'll remember that. Uh, this is the CIDR block. And then it has four subnets. Yeah, I have many, so I'll uh, let me refresh. So I'll refresh the subnets by VPC ending 74. That's why I remembered it. So four subnets. You can see the side blocks. I could have designed it any which way I wanted. Okay, zero, uh, zero, 16, zero, one, four, four, zero, whatever. So we can design that. And uh, it's a slash 20. So I took a slash 16 block as in a large block with 64,000 IPs and I divided it into subnets, subnetworks, right? And each subnet is about four, thousand IP. So I can have up to 16 subnetworks. I can create eight more. That's what it means with this kind of a configuration. Now, two of these are public, two of these are private. It also has a name, public or private, but name doesn't make it public or private. What really makes it public or private is the presence of the internet gateway. So if I look at the private, the route table says just this local route versus public has this route plus internet gateway. Yeah, that is what we have here. Okay, so this and this basically. And then there is an internet gateway created and associated with this VPC, right? So there is a route table, there is a subnet, there is a VPC. So VPC is the network that you create. And then you divide that into subnetworks so that you can create. So you can see that this these subnets belong to two different availability zones. Yeah, one public in availability zone one C, one in one B, one private in one B, one in one C. Right. So that's how you're gonna see this. So this is a private in one C. This is a public in one C. This is a public in one C. This is a private in one C. 1B, sorry. So that's how you have the subnets created. Basically, this is the diagram which has been implemented there. And then there is a route table associated with this. There is a route table associated with these subnets. And that is how all of this uh, is been designed here. That's how you create secure network infrastructure on cloud. This is the resource map, the VPC, four subnets, Two public, uh, two of these are private. 
private can have their own route table or it can be just one route table between these two. That's also fine. And this is what you must at least minimum design in order to create and set up a secure cloud infrastructure, basically, right? Uh, any questions so far? Uh, Garo, one quick question. This is Sarfraz here. Go ahead, Sarfraz. So let's say your uh, laptop is connected to Wi-Fi uh, and uh, you're, you are using your mobile through mobile network. So mm -hmm. while speak these two devices, while speaking to the outside world, uh, it will send two different IP addresses, right? Absolutely. Yes. So what you're, just for understanding of everyone, what uh, Sarfraz is saying is, I'm on my home network, sure. I have a laptop, I have a cell phone. Now, if I were connected via Wi-Fi, then they're on the same network. They can talk to each other. They'll have the same IP address in the same range, like 192, 168, maybe 1.2, 1.3, like that. But if the moment I don't use this Wi-Fi and connect it to the cell phone tower, right, somewhere, then they're part of different networks. So network-wise, I mean, they can be physically in the same location, but network-wise, they are going via different uh, network altogether. So it can be, if they want to communicate, then it could be over a Bluetooth or over a internet, actually. It will, allow, it will be like this. So it can be different network, yes. Yeah, thanks, Gauru. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, good question. Any Anything else? I am good from my side. All right, perfect. Thank you, Sarfraz. Any any other question from anyone else? Okay. Uh, I understand it's a lot of lot to digest. I'm not going to give you any assignment for this week, uh, except for touching base on uh, the networking topics. That includes the networking, everything that I just shared with you. Uh, kind of explained with a lot more theory here. Uh, plus, you have the wizard sign on networking. Uh, go through that. And I'll create a quiz instead of a project for this week for you to take so that you are able to design your own networks. That's what you should learn. Start learning. Next week, I will show you how to create it from scratch and talk about a few more things. And then we'll start with EC2, right? And then we'll start with the uh, mission to with deploying front-end application service where we talk about EC2 and rest of the configurations here, right? So that's why I said we'll adjust this based on, depending on this is the first iteration we are doing, depending on the workload and how much time it takes, we'll kind of adjust that. Uh, so the homework for you is to go through the network design, read through it, understand networking concepts, Create an AWS account if you don't have one. Create a VPC using a visit. It's very easy. Just create a VPC, VPC and more. Uh, you can keep it as is. You can just remove this to none. Either way is fine. And uh, create a VPC with this kind of a resource map. Very easy, very straightforward. Resource map is what you should be going through to understand it and try to identify which one is the public subnet, which one is not, how the route tables are created and associated, how the internet gateways work, right? Next time I'll show you how to create the VPC from scratch using some advanced configuration and uh, your own custom CIDR blocks. How can you mix and match the CIDR blocks? Like if you want to create uh, different subnets for different applications like one of these diagrams I showed. Yeah, something like this. And you can create different CIDR blocks also. This can be slash 20. This can be slash uh, 25. This can be or slash 28. This can be slash 19. You can create different combinations of it or, you know, something like that. So you can create like slash 24. So depending on how you want to design it, how many uh, devices you want in which subnet and stuff, you can design this very flexibly using CIDR blocks. If you understand these concepts, 
you will not only have a very clear understanding of networking and security, we will talk about that, but also you will be able to design your own networks, you will be able to crack the interviews, you will be able to troubleshoot a lot of things based on this understanding. Because troubleshooting is all about understanding things and then being able to implement it and uh, kind of uh, figure out what happens when and all that, right? I'll show you all of that as we go along. In the next week, we'll focus on more of VPCs. I'll also show you some advanced concept like pairing of VPCs and all of that as well. And then we'll get started with the second mission about uh, uh, deploying the front end services and onwards, right? So any other questions for now? Uh, just one thing, like how to access the course? Uh, uh, the course on system engineering, you can, if you are a member already, uh, you can log in and just go to courses. And from there, you uh, just browse to the system engineering bootcamp, right? It's as simple as that. This is a system engineering bootcamp. You can search from uh, maybe foundational bootcamps here. Uh, <laughs> and it has system engineering, or you can search for it here also. So it's the systems engineering bootcamp, which has the content on VPC. Networking is the second week's agenda that we are talking about right now. So this is something I want you to go through along with the recording of this video, which will be published on, uh, I'll, I'll share it on the community once it is uploaded. And uh, we'll start uh, from there, we'll take it from there. So this is where you, uh, you can access this content. Thanks, thanks, Khan. Sure, Khatib. All right, so bring in more questions also. Let's make it more interactive, right? So you can bring in as many questions as you have. Uh, go through it and uh, try to bring more questions during the sessions also. That would benefit not only you, but everyone else in, as part of this uh, these sessions. All right. So, oh, hey, hi, hi, Gaurav. Hey, Venamra. Yeah, uh, I just have one question. Uh, go ahead. I mean, can, can we create two VPC in two different regions and that can be uh, connected Connected with each other? Yes. The only prerequisite is you must create it with different side blocks. So there is something called as VPC peering. So you can create VPCs in different regions, peer them. The only prerequisite is if this VPC has a side block of, let's say something like this, this has to be different. It can just be 10.1.0.0. This is a different side block. It can be 172, 17, 0.0 16. It can be some other range. As long as it is a unique range and a different, uh, these can be peered actually. All of these can be peered together. So this is called as a VPC peering. It's very easy, very straightforward. It is possible okay. just that the range uh, side block has to be different. If you have same side block here and there, there it's that's not possible. Okay. And not only this, not only different region, yeah. you can peer the VPCs between different accounts also. So you can, your VPC and my VPC, we can connect them <coughs> from different accounts. That's okay. also possible. Okay. Yeah. So for that also VPC peering, uh, I mean, yeah, VPC peering. VPC peering. Because VPC oh. peering, when you establish the peering, there is a peering gateway. And that peering gateway can be anywhere. So you can see that this is my VPC ID. Uh, this is what I want to start peering uh, connection from and to whom? To another account, to my account. That's okay. where account between cross account comes in. This is the region, this region, another region. So you can do not only regional, but also across the accounts. And if I provide your account ID uh, and if you have a VPC ID that you give me, I can establish or send a connection request. You have to accept it. Only then this starts hearing and connect it. Uh, but that's how it, it happens. It's very easy, actually. We will look at okay. this, how to peer it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.
All right. Any further questions? I'm just going to give you a few seconds for any further question. Otherwise, we'll close. All right. Awesome, folks. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I hope this has been useful. Um, do share your feedbacks also on the WhatsApp or uh, you can you know uh, mention it here or share it on the WhatsApp or otherwise. Uh, most of us are connected over WhatsApp, I believe. So that's it for this week. So thank you for attending hey, today's session. Sorry, we will be sharing this recording session. Yes, I would be. I would be sharing this recording along with last week's uh, Inner Circle call as well. I have both recordings. I'll okay. process it and share it by tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So that's it for now, folks. So thank you. And uh, I'll see you on Thursday for our Inner Circle call as usual. And Monday we'll come back and uh, uh, continue with this journey. So thank you and uh, uh, all the best. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Have a great Bye. week. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you have a great week ahead, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.